So if you have lived here a long time, it's not a surprise. Don't tell me I should have moved here back in 86. Okay, thank you. 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 Thank you
and it means sovereign Lord. It starts off with sovereign Lord, but it means a couple of specific ideas. One, it's a word that would be used for someone like a slave owner, but the connotation is that it is someone who has unchallenged authority, a sovereign that has un is unchallengeable. And so when they pray, they, they start off with this acknowledgement, this unchallengeable um, power. What's the next thing that happens in the prayer? They describe their understanding of this sovereign Lord. How, do, how, is, how is the sovereign Lord described? And I've already told you that there's three things that I'm looking for. Yeah. Creator. Creator. Absolutely. How else has he described? Spoke through his servant David, but that's kind of in, an interesting. But what did he speak through his servant David? Asking a question. Why are the people raging? Yeah, David is saying, "Why did the why did, why are the people raging against God?" Raging. What is the mouthpiece of the Holy Spirit? And what is what is what is that section doing? It is. He's very much a mouthpiece, and God is doing what? He's revealing. He's a God of revelation. That he speaks through his servants and the prophets to say, this is how things are or are going to be. What's the third way he's described? They have, before they get to their request, they talk about this sovereign Lord in three ways. Healer? Hmm? Healer? Talks about healing here. Powerful. 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 And how does he talk about how things play out? About conspiring against Jesus. Yep. That's that's a foretelling. That's a, a revelation of yeah, this is gonna happen. Yeah. How does how does all this play out? He organizes it and and uh, sets it sets it in motion. It predetermined. Um, I'm going to use a word that is made famous several election cycles ago. <laughs> I don't know if I spelled that right. The decider. He's the one that says this is how it's going to happen. And so there are people are conspiring. Nations rage and rise up. But whose purpose does all of that serve? Right? And so it's interesting that they start off, it, they start off their prayer with this idea that he is the creator, the revealer, and the person who's really in charge of everything. It seems like it's an acknowledgement of their understanding the early church's understanding of who god is and it's important for them to do that and it makes me wonder how often we remind ourselves of who we are in relationship to god so first they clarify who god is in relation to them then they have three requests what are their three requests because this is still part of their prayer. They say, this is who you are. Now here's what we need. What are their three requests? Mm 
speak with boldness. Speak boldly. Yep, they're asking, give us the ability to do this. What else are they asking for? Healing. Signs and wonders. What else did they ask for? First one. My yeah, it says uh, hear their threats. So like listen to the threats of our enemies. Don't ignore them. What do you find interesting about these three things? Because these are their requests, right? You find anything interesting about, they just got out of jail. They've been pulled before the authorities. They've been warned as sternly as possible, knock it off. They go back, they meet with their people, they acknowledge who God is, and then they ask for three things. They want to be able to continue to speak boldly. They want to still have the signs and wonders that are convincing people. And they start with, hear our threats, consider our threats. Sure. I just think it's kind of interesting that they sort of acknowledge their understanding, at least, of God putting all of these terrible things in motion um, in terms of how, how Jesus was treated um, and so forth in, um, in the enemies. Uh, whether that's a misunderstanding or... or an incomplete understanding of, of how God works. I don't know. Um, but then he says, um, then it says, hear their threats as if, as if that understanding doesn't extend to the, the current situation um, or what's in their immediate, immediate future, as if, if they really understand God to be the decider and the, the, the being that put all of this into motion and, and sets it all up that he wouldn't hear their threats anyways. Like, why does he need to be asked to hear that? It's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, he, they, they pray, consider their threats and, and enable uh, your servants, us, to speak your word with boldness. If I was being threatened, I would be praying for more than just speaking boldly. Let me get into more trouble. <laughs> yeah. That's what I really want. Get me into more trouble. Let me speak even more boldly. So what's not here? What's not in their request? Protection. Is there anything beyond protection? Removal of the problem. Crush them like grapes under your heel. Not here. Why do you think that is? Was there any hint of self-interest in their request? They could have asked for vengeance. What do they ask for instead? Make us stronger. That's interesting. That's very interesting. Yeah, Jody. I wonder if verse 28 had something to do with that. They did what your power and will had decided <laughs> that you should happen. Perhaps they were resigned. Perhaps they understood that things had already been decided. They needed to get with the program. I mean, they spent quite a bit of time with Jesus, and he told them, yeah, you don't really want the faith I'm going to suffer, but you're going to get it anyway, right? And he told them. They kind of knew. And so it's interesting that they're not asking for protection because they kind of they have this idea that this is a drama is playing out. And Jesus has tried to get them to understand what the nature of this drama. Because in Israel at the time, it seems like it would be unusual not to pray 
to this all-powerful person to say, rescue us by wiping them out. Yeah. I don't see them asking for those types of things because those are more like ultimate results. It feels like they're looking for tools. I like that. Why does someone need tools? Get results. Keep working. Keep working to build something. It hadn't been very long since they saw Jesus raised from death. They were still really on fire with the thought that this really was the Son of God. So that would make them very bold because they knew the possibilities. I think sometimes I forget how powerful that must have been. They were with this person for a considerable period of time. They watched him die. And then they were convinced that he was raised, he was resurrected. Man, that, that has to be so, so powerful. So powerful, yeah. Um, in Luke 9, 54, it says, when the disciples, James and John, saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to destroy them? But then Jesus turned and rebuked them. So this is the same person. John is the one that came back with Peter, and I'm sure Peter knew this whole story too. But um, when James and John asked for God to revenge something, he wasn't so keen to do it. And I think their prayer in this verse kind of reflects what they learned with being with Jesus, that revenge is never what is never in God's will. <laughs> I love that because who did they ask? They realized that they had power. The Holy Spirit had given them power. Who did they ask? Should we call down fire and destroy these people? Who did they ask? The creator of fire. Yeah. <laughs> so that's just fascinating to me that it would be it would have been interesting to do a psychological study on them from pre-Jesus through post ascension to heaven to see how their minds were working. And and we we I guess that's what the New Testament is, is it, it's glimpses into what they were thinking because man, the hubris to say Hey, creator and ruler of the universe, do you want us to call down fire on these people? Yeah. <laughs> and they're Absolutely. They had an understanding of the scriptures. Absolutely. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. When you talk about a psychological analysis, I wonder what the resurrection and the ascension to heaven would have done to them psychologically. In other words, as they're building this church and they're speaking their truth, they understand that death doesn't have to win. They have seen that miracle firsthand. They were in the inner circle. I wonder if they felt bolder because perhaps they had in their hearts the promise that maybe for them, whatever befell them, whatever horrors they they were going through, there might be a way through. And you know what I mean? Like, look what happened to Jesus. He was crucified in a terrible way. He rose again. He clearly has power. He ascended to heaven. He told us to go and and make disciples. I wonder if they felt bold because perhaps they thought there was a promise that death could not conquer them either. I, I would have thought, well, I'm one of Jesus's chosen. I mean, this is my sinful nature. I'm in the inside. So maybe if someone hurts me or if something terrible happens to me, you know, I'll be resurrected and go get to be with, you know what I mean? There's psychologically, they might have felt emboldened. I don't know. Which Randy were here because you, I got to use a sports metaphor here. If you already know that you are going to win the game, how afraid are you going to be to shoot the ball? 
I'm not a three point shooter. I'd be launching threes left, right, and center. If I know we've already, we're already going to win the game. I'm not going to worry if I dribble it off my foot or pass it to the other team or launch a three when maybe I shouldn't have. I'm going to go for it. Uh, I think here and then here. To continue that metaphor, when Jesus when Jesus ascended, what did he tell them to do? He said, preach this word to all the nations. I'm not remembering exactly what he said, but he told them to go and speak. And so I guess with your metaphor, if Jesus told you, just go shoot the ball and you're going to win, you would be praying, help me shoot the ball better. And he also said, yeah, you're going to get fouled a lot. Too. <laughs> it seems to me that incomplete knowledge may have helped them here also, mm. because if they had really known that they were going to win the game, but it was going to be over 2,000 years. I wonder if their motivation would have been the same. Mm, yeah. Quintillion overtime, right? Yeah. Yeah, that, that's a good point. And so maybe in some cases, a little bit of ignorance is okay. It may be a bliss, right? Uh, yeah, that's, that's interesting. I, did I see another hand? Yes. Well, you know, it sort of strikes me as that this change from pre-crucifixion disciples to, to this uh, post-ascension disciples was sort of a process, you know, because um, they were still very mixed up uh, about what all this meant. And then on the, as the disciples were returning to Emmaus and they Christ met with them, they explained the prophecies, and they went back and talked to the others. You know, there was this sort of this growth process there. And then, then you know, at his ascension, you know, he said, go, gather together and wait for the Holy Spirit. And so there was... That there was this whole process they went through, little by little, to get to this place where now they're asking for boldness. I love that idea because how does that translate to us now? It wasn't, I'm going to reveal all truth at once, and there it is. There was this gradual revelation and increase in understanding over time. And that's encouraging to me because I don't have to understand everything complete right now. I can continue to grow and learn. And as God reveals truth to me through communication and through this kind of process, revealed truth. I love that. And to bounce off of that, I, I think it's an excellent example of God's importance that he places on our free will in order to decide to do this. When you look at number three, the decider, and you read, they carried out what your hand and will had decided beforehand would happen. I don't think he decides what each of us do. I think what he decides is what he does and what his victory is. What is God in control of? He is in the ultimate control of what he does and what his outcome is. And I think that's what we can put our faith in. And that helps us decide what our requests are. A really true understanding of who he is helps us maybe do this in different ways than we would have if we didn't understand all that. And maybe that changes, this changes for us as we gain a better and clearer understanding of this. Paul talks about baby Christians. <laughs> Their requests might be different than when they become older Christians with a deeper understanding. That's, that's I, I like that point. Um, so, They acknowledge, they ask, what happens? <laughs> Sticking with our theme of three, what happens <laughs> when they ask for these things? 
What's the first thing that it says? Sort of. <laughs> yeah. Where does that fit in to the requests? Signs and wonders. Yeah. What do they ask for? I think in the text it says, um, hear their threats, speak boldly, and then signs and wonders. And he goes in reverse order, or at least he starts there. It's a sign, it's a wonder. What what else happens? What what else is what are the other responses to their requests? Well, boldly. Get filled with the Holy Spirit. I'd say there's a number four, too. The next verse says, all the believers were united in heart and mind, which kind of goes with the, the Holy Spirit. So. Yeah, so the result of this process is that they were united in one heart and mind. Do you think they all agreed about every particular of everything? <laughs> Probably not. Maybe for like five minutes. <laughs> Let me take a little sidebar here. And I don't know... We'll see. I want you to think about this as we move through Acts, because I think that there are some parallels. Think about Revelation. What are the three beasts in Revelation? And this is kind of a sidebar, I know, but we're gonna we'll come back. What are the three beasts in Revelation? What's the first one that's mentioned? Dragon, right? Satan. What's the next beast? <laughs> In general terms. Be prepared for apps. <laughs> That's why it's a sidebar. I know I'm showing you a curve. I'm installing a new play during a timeout. I get that. What do those three beasts do? Because think, I want you to think about this in relation to what happened immediately after Pentecost. You were going to say. What immediately happens after Pentecost? They start preaching boldly in the temple courts. What happens? They get arrested. Persecution. This is, this is the first time. It's not going to be the last. There's another time. This time, they just get a stern talking to. What happens next time? I know I'm skipping ahead. They get beaten and then a stern talking to. So there's persecution. It's the first thing right out of the gate after persecution. I mean, after mm -hmm. Pentecost. What's the next thing that happens? We're going to read about this next week. There's Pressure from without, persecution from outside. The next thing to happen to them, Ananias and Sapphira. Something from within. Something from within. A subversion, if you will. Third thing to happen, and I know I'm skipping ahead, but I just want to prime you as we get, get there. Distraction. What was the first big to do in the church? Oh, these widows aren't getting taken care of as good as these widows. And now, so we have persecution from without, subversion from within, and then distraction. Let's get them talking about things that aren't the main point. Let's get them not focused on Jesus, but on this administrative stuff and if we think so i want us to think about three beasts in revelation as we think as we move through acts and see what the parallels are because what's happening there's persecution there's subversion there's distraction all through revelation it talks about those things you know they're going to be given power 
to harm God's people, to kill them, and then do things that are going to distract them. So interesting parallels, I thought, because those three things right out of the gate, I mean, pressure from outside, pressures from inside, and then, well, okay, let's just distract them, get them talking about things that aren't so important. Um, end of sidebar. So he answers by a sign, filling them with the spirit and giving them um, boldness, boldness to speak. It's a direct and immediate answer. So the next thing of three. They've gotten out, they go back to their people, they tell them, they pray, they understand who God is, they ask for specific things, they've been given answers, now what? How does this affect their attitude? Because then we read on, you know, the consequences of this commitment to the common life. What are the consequences to that commitment? What is their attitude? As we read on after the after the prayer and after the shaking and the filling and the what, what's next? They were generous. Yeah. So what is their attitude generally about themselves and each other? Servant serving yeah. others. It wasn't about them. Give us some very specific things in there. What specifically does it say? It's kind of thought that everything that I have isn't really mine. I'm in charge of it, and I'm maybe being a good steward of it but it's really for everybody. That's a different kind of an attitude. Um, attitude is one thing. What, what did it inspire them to do? What was the action? Because we could say that this is a radical. My version of the Bible says, and great grace was upon them all. And what does grace include? Grace is our relationship, I believe, with how we treat others. Mm. What does it <clears throat> look like? You can't see it, but you feel it. How was grace? How, how have you, and I'm going to ask you this question again later, so be primed. What, did it, what does it look like for you? What, what kind of action does it inspire? What action does it inspire in them? They sold their houses and land. They gave the money to the apostles. They had stuff that they gave away. They, there had to be a level of trust here. Um, I mean, it says that now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Um, that kind of unity, um, that's hard to fathom because it doesn't say, you know, the 12 of them or whatever. It says the multitude of those who believe um, we're of that heart and soul and out out of that sort of uh unity um is is where the communal sort of um uh compilation of of all that they had was shared and and all that and without that unity and without enough grace to maybe slightly disagree with somebody but not have it affect your heart and your soul and the unity of your heart and your soul 
together. You wouldn't be able to to say, hey, you know, here's my land. Here's here's all that I own. Um, we're all going to um, together uh, uh, do good things with this. Um, you have to have trust. You know, you're just pushing my buttons. Are you trying to tell me that I can still be your friend even if I don't always agree with you? It, yes. Yeah. Well, you can be my friend. I don't know about other people. <laughs> I feel better. I don't, trust, I don't trust others. <laughs> just to build on that, Jerry, you must be cut from the same cloth, Jerry. I was sitting here thinking to myself, what would it take for me to sell all of my belongings right now and put them at the feet of somebody? What would it take? What would it take for you to sell your house, to sell your 401k, to sell your cars, to sell all your things right now and bring that money to someone else? There has to be a level of security. We as humans, I think we're built to want to have some sort of security, most of us, some sort of assurance that we have a place to put our heads, that we have safety that we have even privacy, there, there would have had to have been some level of primal security for people to do that. Unity is great. And I think that is true. I think what Jerry said is absolutely true. They wanted to be together, but to sell all of your things is, is a, a, a completely foreign thing for most of us because of that security need. Mm -hmm. To that must fair, have been met somehow. Absolutely. To be fair, how many people were asked to sell everything? None. None. Didn't Jesus ask like one person, sell everything you have, give it to the poor, follow me. So we might not be talking about everybody sold everything they had and then so, Jack. This was not communism, right. where the state took it off. And but nobody, you said that for nobody was asked to sell everything. I'm sorry. It says those who had lands, it's plural, and those who had houses sold them. Nobody was asked to sell their land or their house, but if they had lands and houses, they had some flexibility. So this was really tax the rich. Excuse me. It was not communism it was high taxes on the wealth and it was voluntary because they had but you know it was a mobilization of resources and the other thing is there was the need the need was you joined jesus you were out of your job your boss fired you there was no income your children were hungry so you know it was a time of need and the response was those who could did but there was no it was not you sell your house and give it to her and just hope it works out all right. Yeah. That's that's not exactly what it said. He's taking us through this, this we have a theme of three, right? Attitude, action. Think about the principle behind this. Yes. Well, I find it interesting if we look at it in that way that some of the people that were in this group had lands and houses, and some of the people in this group had great need. They did not have enough money. So going back to the idea of trust there were some stinking rich people with some really poor people and they all were of one heart and mind. And that's a lot bigger than, oh, there's a bunch of really poor disciples that now they don't have Jesus and they're all poor together having being of one mind. This is a lot of different people. <laughs> well, and I there's, think it says no one claimed any of their possessions was their own. I, that's a really good point because we're not talking about a bunch of dirt poor people that had nothing. As it was their only and last hopes. Some people that had means and education bought into this as well. And that trust thing, that's that's a big thing. So what about this principle? Radical attitude, sacrificial action based on what? And Jack hinted to at it a little bit. Jerry. To me, the, the principle part of it is that's where we get things like a little bit backwards because we look at the action here and we say, oh, well, this was this was asked of them or this was the, the price to pay in order to sort of buy your way into this, into this. Um, so so here's here's what we have to do in order to 
joining feet. And and um, the way that I the way that I read this, it just seems like they had they had they were compelled to preach the gospel, to share the story, to share the person of Jesus with people. And this was the way that they could mobilize the resources they had to get that done. I like Jody's point that someone else talked about trust, the level of trust that must have been there. Or to quote, you know, lady, just think on rich people. They're thinking rich, not they don't stink. You know, <laughs> there must have been some trust. There must have been a wholesale buying of what Jesus was selling. Still want to talk about what's the actual principle. Yes, Mel. And to the principal point, I think some of this, you know, you talked about they recognized who God was. Mm. I think one of the key parts of this whole passage and understanding was that they actually came to a recognition of who they were. Um, because we as human beings tend to like to put ourselves in the position of God. Um, and I think to Walter's point, they will ask for tools. I'd almost take it a step further and they realized they were the tools and they were asking for sharpening. Oh, I like that. And so it's when we realize that we're just the tool in the hand of the master. What is possession? You're, you're just a tool. Did they sell everything and say, okay, there's, well, there was, there was 12 and then there was 3000 and then let's just round it off to 5,000. Maybe at this point, I don't know, maybe 10. They sold everything and then say, okay, we're going to divide this 5,000 ways. So what was the principle behind this attitude of service focusing us? focus on others and yeah this isn't really mine it's for the good of everyone um and i'm willing to sacrifice to help others what was the real principle behind it it wasn't just like, okay it's all everybody's going to have the same thing what was it the individual needs Who has need? Equitable distribution. Fair isn't always same, right? I don't have children of my own, but from parents that I do know, I've heard that you treat all your kids with love and fairness, but you don't treat them all exactly the same because they're different people, they have different needs. I, I found that in the classroom. I can't treat all of my kids the same, right? So, question is, what do we do with this? I don't think we can dismiss this idea because when they did, Peter's like, oh, you got to take up a collection for the Greeks because you guys aren't doing this well enough. When they kind of dismissed it, either through choice or neglect, so, oh, we got to take up the collection because these people are in need. So I don't think we can dismiss the idea. But to Jack's point, I don't think that this is a mandate for some kind of Christian communism. And by communism, I mean, let's all sell everything we have and move to Antelope, Oregon. Right? <laughs> I don't think that's the thing either. So what does this mean? And who are we? Oh, go ahead. So I'm confused because you say not Christian communism. What? Do you mean then by equitable distribution? Oh, that's a good question. I'm not sure I know what I mean because I think that it would matter. It would depend on the circumstances. If you tell me that you say, oh, man, I am in dire need of a third car. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe that's not equitable. <laughs> And, the, and this is where it gets really challenging because we see later on in Acts through the um, distraction part, the distraction part, we can get caught up with things that are not the core. 
So that's where it gets sticky. And I don't know if I have an answer to that because who gets to decide who gets money from the benevolent fund that's taken after every communion? Somebody's got to make a decision on who has the need and where who gets some, something, right? That's a really hard question. And I think that it's important because we're called to this in some form. We're called to this same thing that the early church was experiencing. You, um, you raise your hand because you have an answer now, right? I have a, I have an edit. Okay. Maybe instead of equitable distribution, it should be grace-filled distribution. Like grace, I believe the dictionary definition is free, unmerited favor. So if Jack sells five acres and I just lost my job and I have nowhere to live, he might help me. So that is free unmerited favor that Jack is showing to me. It may not be equitable. Anyway, I'm, I'm probably getting stuck on this point. But. I think it's important because we have to wrestle with it. It's, well, <clears throat> I was thinking about trying to answer her question. And in my mind, the definition of communism is those who happen to be in power go take things from people that have extra rather than the people that have extra willingly giving up to a central place where people can go, or as she just suggested, if somehow I had or Jack had extra land, she just had a horrible fire that, that burned down her whole house. Hey, there's some land, there's some wood. I don't have time, but build yourself a new house. Maybe someone else has some time to think about. Okay, yeah, no, I think these are really important questions because it's how we deal with each other in the real world day to day. Well, and I think the most important thing is not focusing on, like in the present day, how can we be equitable or what can we distribute or who should be distributing? The question is, are we going back to the attitude? Are we tr learning to trust each other and focusing on the gospel? Because that's, that's how they became, got to this point of sharing. And if we're not focusing on that, we'll never be sharing in the right way. Yeah, I like that. Refocusing on what is our attitude? What is our understanding of who God is and who we are in relation to him? And what does that mean because of what he's done for us? How does that change our attitude? The last few minutes, I want to spend some time um, telling stories. And you're going to get to tell stories. Because I think one of the things that's powerful about an experience with people together is understanding each other. And I'll start us, and then you get to tell your own stories. Um, I want to hear stories of how this kind of a, a thing happened in your life. Now, you can tell a story about when you did something nice for someone else. Love to hear those. But I also want to hear stories about when someone did something for you. It was unexpected, unmerited, unasked for that was super helpful. We had just gotten married. We moved to Southern California. And um, back in the day, um, kids didn't always get a credit card when, before they flew the coop. So we moved to Southern California, did not have a credit card, did not have a refrigerator, apartment didn't have one. We had to wait six months to get a credit card so we could buy a refrigerator. We also inherited a bed. It's nice to have one, but it was bad. And our two friends down there knew that my back was killing me because of this terrible, why is your back? Oh, our bed is horrible. It's terrible. One time we went on a weekend trip somewhere. They had a key to our apartment so they could like take care of the plants or whatever. We get back. We walk in, walk into the bedroom. Something looks different. The bed is about this much higher than it used to be. They had come in, hauled off the old bed, bought us a new bed. We didn't ask for it. She did. He's <laughs> lying about your back. He's lying about your back. 
Do you have stories like that? Second one, and then I'll quit and you guys talk. We had our first apartment was a studio. My parents came to visit. They're on the floor. No refrigerator. We went to work Friday or whatever, Monday, I think, and we were you know, going to work and they were gonna go back home. We get home. No, we had just gotten the refrigerator. I think we had just gotten the refrigerator. We come back from work, they're gone. Our refrigerator is full of food and we had a vacuum cleaner in the middle of our, we call it living room, our one room, because we didn't have a vacuum. Now, that might have been selfish on their part, because if they come back, they don't want to sleep on a dirty floor. But stories, have you experienced this kind of attitude? And how did it make you feel? Yeah. A little bit different, but... I've learned um, that I get lessons in graciousness every now and again. And um, sometimes we are super busy and yet there's a need for something else, something more. And I call that God's lessons in graciousness to me, you know, the principle, love and action. Yeah, powerful, huh? Other examples? Yeah. Uh, I had small children in my grocery cart and grocery carts full, pull into the register, you know, the groceries are being run through. And then I realized I've left my wallet at home. And, and, and I just panic came over me and uh, the manager came over and he, he recognized me. And he said, uh, don't worry, go home. I know you'll come back in the game. Wow. Wow. Yeah. That brought, brought a flashback. When I had young children, my husband was out of town and it was an icy Friday night and it had been a rough day at work. And I knew we were all going to be together all weekend long, the, me and the kids, and my husband would be gone. So we went up to El Sombrero and I ordered a plate for all of us. So four plates. And when I went to pay, I realized I also didn't have my wallet. And it was super icy outside. And it had taken us quite a bit of time to get up there slowly. And here we had eaten. And I'm wearing my Walla Walla University sweatshirt. <laughs> and so the guy comes with the check. And I, and I said, I am so embarrassed. I don't have my wallet. I cannot believe I, I did this. I'm, I, can I leave my, can I, can I leave my, you know, my house, what, what can I right, leave with? Me? <laughs> I thought about it and the chill, the kids were horrified. They were, they were like, what's going to happen? And I said, I'm just so embarrassed. Can I go home and get my wallet and come back? And he said, it's too icy. You should not be on the road anyway. He said, don't worry about it. It's on the house. Oh. And I said, no, but I'm just really embarrassed. I'm so sorry. I do want to pay you. And he said, no, no you go home and be with your kids, be safe in your home, it's on the house. So the next day after church, I put the kids in the car, we came to church, we drove up to El Sombrero and I marched in with them and I said, I wanna pay my bill from last night. And the waiter that had helped me was the son of the owner or the manager. And the manager was there and he said, my son told me what happened and we're not gonna accept your payment. <laughs> he, said, he said, it's on the house. We wanted you to be safe and with your family. Mm -hmm. I've always remembered that. Yes. And where did where did you go weekly all the way through COVID? <laughs> to keep them in business. Yeah. Nice. Yes. Um, I have some low income Hispanic friends, and um, I coordinated with a local um, Hope Heals, an organization that gives like a move-in care package. So when they moved into their house, they got a vacuum and sheets and soap, all kinds of stuff um, through that. And so that was one part of the story, I guess. But the, the part that was to me, we can stop by their house any night and she'll make really good uh, Guatemalan food and give it to us <laughs> and never ask for anything. Um, 
even though they don't have much money and they have another kid on the way. Um, so just, um, and I think that's impacted me over my life is the people that have the least amount of money are the most willing to give you food <laughs> without mm-hmm. anything in return. That's cool. That's cool. They were showed kindness. Now they're showing kindness. Other stories. Mm-hmm. I think these are powerful examples to hear from each other. Because I think we could we all have these. And the more we talk to each other about them, the more we understand how we're all kind of in the same boat. Yes. My son was a missionary in um, Batumi, Georgia. And um, he wanted to take us up to one of his friend's village, which meant a huge ride up really bad snowy mountain. And then we got to a certain point, so they came down with an army truck and took us up a little farther. And then we had a hike in knee deep snow up to Zarab's village, which was so primitive. I mean, it was, you could see through the cracks in the walls. Wow. But these people were so generous. They, they gave me gifts. They knew we were coming. And they just, you know, it was just so touching. We had brought things from Iowa, all keychains and different things, bought everybody candy. But you know, the things that they gave me, I mean, I still have, and they just had nothing. And they they put out everything that they had for food and invited all these people, you know, to this tiny little house and just so generous, you know. And I was so touched because they just had nothing. So it just touched us that, you know, they were giving us gifts and that we did bring them gifts as well. But it was, I just, we just didn't expect to have handmade gifts from these people. Putting another star by attitude because we're hearing that it doesn't take a lot of means to have this kind of an attitude. Mm-hmm. Other stories? Yes. My friend Lau recently passed, and a group of us friends were kind of getting together and reminiscing about you know, stories, kind of like what we're doing here. And one of the things that we noticed kind of part of the way through this is that every single one of our stories was about him helping us with something. And I thought that was a really like touching, I don't know, tribute to him where like he would call people up and be like, hey, what are you working on? That sounds awesome. How can I help you with it? Without you asking, just kind of out of the blue, hey, I haven't heard from you in a while. Can I help you with something? That's not a bad legacy. After you're gone, people talk about you and what are they saying? That kind of thing. James. I wasn't going to tell this because I don't want to make it sound like I'm bragging because I'm not at all and I don't do it all the time but I happened to be over at Costco yesterday got my stuff then I realized I wasn't probably going to make it all the way home without satisfying my urge to need to run in the restroom so I was going back <clears throat> into the <clears throat> back into the store and I happened to pass this couple that was parked in a handicap spot. And for some reason, I got the urge. They had one of those half carts that connects to the wheelchair. And I grabbed the cart and I was like, I can take this back in for you. And I was like, well, that's not necessary. And I was like, nothing's necessary. I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll take this back in for you. And then he he started to wheel the wheelchair in and um. I was like, no, I got them both. He was like, well, are you going that way? I was like, yeah, I'm going. I'm going back in. It's not a problem. And I wish I had had um, said something to the effect of, I'm semi connected with one of the churches whose main mission is to love well. Yeah. I I forgot to add that part, but <laughs> with his wife being the condition she had to be in to need a wheelchair. And then him not having to walk back to the door, I hope they appreciated that. And I want to only mention that because you're saying about attitude, we actually don't have to have any possessions at all to have an attitude of service. I I could have had zero dollars in my pocket, been walking by them and still done the same thing if I had the right attitude. So what do we have? What do we have that we can do this with? In the early church, they talked specifically about money, land, houses, so people could eat. 
what else do we have that is valuable for other people? I, Jerry, and then we we have our expertise, and and um, you know, I I remember uh, one time. Well, Lori and I moved to this valley. We bought some land, built a house, and um, saved. As as you know, reading about this is our first time doing any of this, reading about how to how to do this whole thing, save a certain percentage of what you're going to spend on your house for the landscaping, um, and then um, we just didn't realize that you had to pay sales tax on all the material after the house was built. Um, and there went our money for our landscaping. So over the course of the next year or so, here I am trying to, with the help of her dad, put in sprinkler system and all this kind of stuff on two acres. And I ended up in the hospital um, with an emergency surgery and, and infection and all this kind of stuff. And and um, I just, I mean, I remember it like it's yesterday. They brought, they brought uh, a phone in and showed a video of, my sprinklers on my yard running. Wow. You know, and that's my my brother-in-law, the, the landscape guy. Um, you know, he could do in an afternoon what it what it would have taken me months, you know, to do on, on my own. And I don't know how much time he spent on it, but it was the most overwhelming um feeling of relief that, you know, I, I don't I'm in the hospital. I don't know what kind of condition I'm gonna be to even finish this job and we were supposed to due to our covenants have it done in a certain amount of time and mm-hmm. all this kind of stuff and um you know his ability and the time that he invested there didn't have anything to do with money unless his time was money but but um man that was that was like one of the most amazing gifts that I ever got that's awesome mm-hmm. yeah. um yeah going on with um skills some skills like that are are something that maybe the other person doesn't have at all. They can't, you know, in the same time put in a sprinkler system, but um, I'm a declutter coach. I help people organize and get rid of things. Um, and something that I decided to- Did you put her phone on the <laughs> 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 Your business just took off. <laughs> um, but something I've been praying about um, since I started is how can I, use my business to serve God. And um, something creative that I decided to do was I have a declutter for Jesus discount program thing. So if somebody can't afford or somebody really deserves help with decluttering and they, they can't afford it, I charge them a certain dollar amount that's way less. And then I take a certain amount of money for, that I have in a fund to pay myself. Um, and that money that I pay into that account is tithe. So something interesting that I found recently is like, instead of pulling money out of that account, I just count that I paid my tithe with time. And it's been a really interesting experiment because it makes me realize that not only is money what I can give to God, my time is also something that I can give. Yeah, I love that. Jody, and then back here. One of the most interesting things about working at the university for me has been the value of presence, Uh, uh. particularly for students. And as, as someone my age, I did not, at the college age, I did not realize that someone my age would still worry about who they're going to sit with and who wants to hang out with me. And you, you kind of figure when you're an older adult, you have all that figured out and you don't have any of those insecurities, right? And it's an interesting, it's an interesting thing for me to continue to carry those things as an adult, an older adult, I guess, and to watch college students crave presence. You know, because some of us assume college students don't want to have anything to do with me. <laughs> who wants to, you know, but who wants me to plop down next to them at the cafeteria table, right? I'm not in that coolness, right? <laughs> but, but, but one of the things that I think I value and I've noticed that our youth value, and it is really hard for us to, to slow down and quantify or to be comfortable with is just presence. Just sit with me, just talk to me, just eat with me, just let me hang out with you. And, 
it, sometimes it's easier to shell out cash, to yeah. be honest. But presence <laughs> is so valued. Um, I have to remind of, myself, my computer is here. The desk face is here and the door is over there. And when kids come in, yeah. I have to remind myself, don't keep working while I'm listening. Yeah. yeah. Alex talked about it several weeks ago when his little boy, time to get ready for bed. Okay, but will you keep asking the questions? Oh. Presence, right? Well, and what does it mean to sit down next to someone in a pew in church that you wouldn't normally sit with? What does that mean yeah. Yeah. psychologically for them when you yeah. scoot in next to them? Presence. We're over time, but one more, and then we're going to close. I was just going to say, if you're if you're struggling with ways to uh, what gifts to share, there's a really good book called Everyday Philanthropist or Philanthropy, one of those two. Okay. And it just talks about all the gifts that you have to share. We're all in this together, whether we acknowledge it or not, we're all in this together. Thank you for your contributions. Um, Lois, will you pray for us? Dear Father, we are so grateful for the grace that has been extended to us. Please make us willing to extend that grace to others. In the name of Jesus, amen. Have a great Sabbath.